Okay, on today's show, the BBC seems once again to be throwing their toys out of the pram. Migrants are probably laughing after this latest news, and a parking money grab to watch out for. Let's begin. The article says that figures reveal that only 215 out of the wait for 45,755 migrants who crossed the channel last year have been deported as pressure mounts on the government to deter the dangerous crossings. This equates to just 0.47% of the total, less than 5 in every 1,000. Natalie Epkirk, to hope I pronounced that way, Tory MP for Dover, has demanded a new strategy focus on France, taking responsibility for preventing small boats from leaving their shores and reclaiming them if they were picked up in the Channel. She said the number of Channel migrants who are deported or returned is so low it's not serving as a deterrent. That's why it is vital to stop the boats leaving France in the first place, and migrants picked up in the Channel should be immediately returned to France. The Home Office needs to get a grip on their processing to deport without delay. And it comes after people smuggling gangs are claiming to have the safest boats in a desperate bid to entice migrants to cross the English Channel. A senior investigator at the National Crime Agency said the gangs are more chaotic and sporadic than drug or gun networks where criminals have specific roles. Paul Morris said smugglers from nationality-based groups control different sectors of migrant camps in northern France. The boats are often so flimsy they need reinforcing with wood to prevent the bottom from falling through. And smugglers are cramming more and more people into the boats. Albanian people smugglers have reduced prices for English boat channel crossings to just £3,000 per migrant in an effort to counter the deterrent effect of the government's barge and deportation plans. A Home Office spokesperson said the significant increase in dangerous and illegal journeys into this country puts great pressure on the asylum system, slowing down the processing of individual cases who could face deportation or removal. The illegal migration bill will stop the boats and ensure those arriving illegally are detained and promptly removed to their country of origin or a safe third country. Well, to be honest, I'm sure this latest statistic is just laughable to all the illegal boat people or future Labour voters or whatever you want to call them. Because let's face it, surely if anything it will make them realise that if they're over here, they're more than likely going to stay because just 215 out of over 40 odd thousand is virtually nothing, isn't it? And it's probably, if anything, about the same odds as I've got of going on a date with Amanda Holden. Oh, I hope I'm wrong with that, Amanda. Either way, though, this has got to be a big kick up the bum for the people in the Home Office and the Conservative Party altogether. Because surely this makes it apparent that now, the only way to actually crack down on the illegal boats crossing the Channel at all is actually to get the Australian policy through the House of Commons. I'm sure they try to do it at the moment, although no doubt of course they'll face severe opposition to which could delay things even longer. And you know, don't get me wrong, I've got no problem at all if people come here legally. It's the illegal part that I have a problem with. Because let's face it, why are these people travelling and paying dangerous smugglers in the first place? Why don't they try and come through on a points-based immigration system? I'm guessing that's probably because they realise that they might not actually be able to pass those checks either through criminal records reasons, and therefore could be potential danger to the public, or, I don't know, they might not get enough points, or they might not want to wait for how long that may take. But at the end of the day, the points-based system is there for a reason, and things like this just make a complete mockery of it, don't they? I do think that Tory MP, though, does certainly have a point. Anyone captured, or helped, in the middle of the cross in the channel, certainly should be turned around straight away to back to France from where they came from, because at the end of the day, France is a safe country. So they've surely got no reason to leave there in the first place. And yes, I know, of course, the government will do some sort of speech about this latest statistic and probably chuck a couple of hundred million pounds at for French again to try and improve things. But at the end of the day, we've heard it all before, haven't we? And no matter how many millions of pounds they actually give France, nothing really seems to be changing, does it? I'm guessing that could be something to do with it. I don't know, 70-odd mile coast that they have where the illegal boat people can just take off from, rather than just a couple of hundred people to try and stop them or help them along their way or whatever you want to call it. 
they surely either need a thousand or maybe actually a ten thousand staff to do the job properly. To be honest though, with the way that this is going, I think France doesn't want to take any responsibility from it at all and just perfectly happy to just take any money that we give them, without, it seems, trying to complete their end of the bargain. Especially with the stories we often hear about boats keeping alongside them until they reach the middle point rather than actually stopping them and turning them around. Let's actually just talk a second about the government's barge plan, shall we? It is obviously a little bit better than hotels because let's face it, hopefully now we'll actually be able to go on holiday in our own country and not actually have to worry about if a hotel's fully booked and therefore, of course, have jacked the price up a little bit more to free up some rooms or whatever. But the other day, from what I heard, over 400 people who apparently were mostly male and in their 20s, who no doubt were fleeing from war, whilst, of course, leaving their families behind, as usual, arrived within one day, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, nearly the capacity of one of these barges by itself. So if this keeps up, especially as we're now approaching spring and summertime, surely we'd need a new barge a day, or maybe actually, in the height of summer, two or three barges a day to go along with this plan. And in my opinion, if that is the case, it's certainly not fixing anything at all. And I think the only way we can fix it is if we leave the ECHR, the European Court of Human Rights. And yes, okay, as some people have said in the comments previously, we were one of the countries who helped found it, but quite a lot of things have changed over the past 70-odd years. So in that case, it's probably time we've done away with it, especially if it's hindering our current bills that put them through Parliament, which I'm sure all those lefty lawyers absolutely love, with surely the amount they're probably making out of it. The BBC has contacted Twitter to object over a label on the platform describing it as a government-funded media. The label has only applied to the corporation's at BBC account, which is primarily used for promoting TV programmes, radio shows and podcasts, news-focused accounts such as at BBC News, at BBC Breaking and at BBC World have not been labelled. In a statement, the corporation said, The BBC is and has always been an independent. We are funded by the British public through the licence fee. The licence fee generated about £3.8 billion in 2022, 71% of the BBC's total income. Collection of the fee is carried out by private companies on behalf of the BBC, contracted by the corporation, not the government. The label directs users to Twitter's help centre, where it defines only a separate designation, state-affiliated media. It reads, state-affiliated media is defined as outlets where the state exercises control over editorial content through financial resources, direct or indirect political pressures, and slash or control over production and distribution. In an email to the BBC, Mr Musk wrote, We are aiming for maximum transparency and accuracy. Liking the ownership and source of funds probably makes sense. I do think media organisations should be self-aware and not falsely claim complete absence of bias. Ooh, I bet they love that. All organisations have bias, some obviously much more than others. The BBC operates through a royal charter agreed with the government which says it must be independent, particularly over editorial and creative decisions. The times and manner in which the, its output and services are supplied and in the management of its affairs. Well, to be honest, if anything, I think they're probably on more Labour side than what they are the government. So I suppose they might have a tiny point that way. But at the end of the day, they do get most of their money through the licence fee, which admittedly comes from the public, but price of which is apparently set out by the government. So therefore, it's probably six to one, half a dozen of the other. But at the same time, they are a state broadcaster. And as plenty have said in the past, the government's mouthpiece. So they can't have it both ways, can they? I mean, what would they prefer instead? In the independent bias of the BBC, no doubt. But I personally don't think they're impartial at all. And I certainly won't be buying a TV licence anytime soon. And actually, haven't done for a few years. But either way, though, I'm guessing they probably didn't like Elon Musk's email too much. That tag may just stay. Although, let's face it, the BBC do really need to move with the times and get rid of that royal chart, which is just basically shackling people to the TV licence if they want to watch other TV channels live, such as sporting events or whatever else. And the BBC shouldn't really be in charge, in my opinion, of what people can and can't watch live and demand money from it when, basically, it's got nothing to do with them if it isn't on the BBC. Hopefully, though, the TV licence Royal Charter Protection might, just might, finally come to an end in 2027, when it's up for its next renewal. I mean, admittedly, we don't have Nadine Doys as a culture secretary anymore. I'm guessing by 2027, it potentially, with how popular or unpopular as Rishi appears to be, then it could actually be Labour in power by then. So in which case, I'm guessing it might get swept under the carpet if there isn't a public outcry for the licence to get scrapped. 
But the good news is that a lot more people are aware of the TV licence raw title protection than the last time it was renewed back in 2017, especially with the cost of living crisis going on. We're just looking at what bills we can just get rid of completely, aren't we? And I'm sure among many is the TV licence itself, which will hopefully mean that millions of people will be cancelling their licences between now and then. So either way, the BBC really does need to do what's right, in my opinion, and go the advertising route or the subscription route. I'd prefer advertising because then companies are paying for the BBC and not actually the public. An angry driver wrote on Mumsnet about her situation asking motorists if she was being unreasonable to appeal her parking fine. She explained how most of the streets in her city are either paid parking spaces or for residents with permits to park outside their homes. The woman drove into the city to run errands and parked next to a pay and display machine but it was not working. She claimed that she tried to get the machine to work multiple times but that it also didn't work despite her best efforts. The next pay and display machine was also out of order, and she took pictures of both machines and figured it would be enough to at least challenge any fines that come in. The driver explained how she received a parking fine and the challenge had been turned down. Despite her protesting, she said that she could appeal to the next stage but then if her second appeal is rejected, she would need to pay the full fine. As it is still within the grace period, if she were to avoid appealing the gain, she would only have to pay half of the fine. She added, really, I should have gone back to the car and found somewhere else to park. But I am annoyed that the local council makes a fortune out of drivers park and is awful and equipment poorly maintained. In the form, she admitted that she could have paid by phone, but was not set up with a parking service on the machine. The driver said that she could also walk further, but assured that the pictures of the two other out-of-order machines would have been enough to have the ticket overturned. Citizens' advice, though, suggests that drivers should write to the council to clearly explain why they are appealing the penalty charge notice, the PCN, if the appeal is rejected and drivers are still able to receive a 50% discount. Citizens advice says it is a good idea to pay at this point. To be honest, I don't see why it is her responsibility if she has tried one machine and then walked a little bit further down the street to try another one and then that's out of order. Why is her, her responsibility to then either find somewhere else to park or to then get out her mobile phone and make what may or may not be a costly call to arrange parking? At the end of the day, what if she didn't have a phone? It's surely the council's responsibility to make sure their machines are working properly. I mean, let's face it, often traffic wardens and parking officers do patrol these to give you a ticket in the first place. So if they notice with their machines that a car has turned up and the machine is broken at the time, surely they should be let off with it. Or at least given a one or two hour grace period. Now, sod it, actually, I think the first one, because if they don't get back by then, then why should the council make money out of it? For basically not keeping up their end of the bargain and making sure their machines are working. And who do these people think? they are if they've been given a picture with two machines not working to say oh no you still could have done it this way just expecting everyone out there to have a mobile phone on them i mean what happens if a mobile phone was out of battery maybe if anything machines should either have a free phone number on them to report any faults or actually have a button or a phone or whatever on the machine itself to connect them to someone to report the fault but nowadays, of course, in 2023, you'd like to think that the companies themselves would be able to get a breakdown notification from the machine and then actually go there and fix it. Maybe, who knows, it was full up of money and didn't want to eat any more. But it does make me wonder, though, if I'm guessing they're trying to say that she could have used the phone to pay for her parking, how long will it actually be before machines are wiped away completely altogether and the only way we're able to park is if we pay by a mobile phone app. In which case, I'm sure that would cause a massive problem for a lot of people out there, especially the elderly who, let's face it, a lot of them don't have apps on their phones. If they even have a mobile phone, that is. So personally, if anything, it's just screams of a council money grab, doesn't it? And they're perfectly happy, it seems, just to take more and more money from us, but I'm guessing they never want to admit that they are the ones who are sometimes in the wrong. Because surely, if anything, this has probably caused a mountain of stress for that poor lady, which I'm guessing she certainly didn't need. And if parking is such a problem, and the only space you have got is a pay and display one, then you're going to use it, aren't you? Especially if you need to be somewhere. So whoever owns that pay and display space should make sure their machine machines are actually up to the job and working at the time because surely if anything it's a bit like me going to Tesco's and buying a 50p Mars bar or whatever if there's still that amount and then getting a letter in the post a couple of weeks later saying that hang on we actually forgot to put our prices up on that to £1.50 you owe us a quid I don't think so but let's just hope she also doesn't get caught out by the invisible speeding camera in this video which to be honest I'm sure that plenty of people have done anyway subscribe for more and I'll see you in the next one